throw a chair through a window and call it a day. By Jaded Ghoster Read by Rat Overlord Chapter 6 I cried my way into this mess, I'll cry my way out. Summary Aizawa's fifth course of action, therapy. In the time it took Shota to transfer his student from the floor of the hallway to the couch in Nezu's office, he'd realized several things. The first is that normally, a scary looking teacher walking next to a crying student typically doesn't garner the best kind of attention. He had to spend two minutes engaging in an aggravating eye conversation to convince Majima that, no, he was not expelling his student. He gets that he has a reputation for that kind of thing, but seriously? What kind of reason could he possibly have to kick out his own secretary? The second is that Netsu's office had a lot more furnishing than he had originally thought. Aside from the desk and chair, he also had a large couch with quite a few fluffy blankets and throw pillows. If the underground hero didn't know any better, he'd say that this room was deceptively warm and comforting so Netsu could trick the misbehaving kids sent to his office into thinking he would go easy on them, instead of making them wish that they were dead. Yeah, he didn't know any better. Finally, the third was Shota realizing that he had no idea how to deal with crying kids. Well, actually, Midoriya wasn't crying anymore, just a few sniffles from time to time. He seemed to have calmed down during the walk there, as well as the few minutes Shota spent analyzing everything he realized. By no means did that mean the kid was in a good state, though. Midoriya, knees tucked into his chest as he sat on Netsu's sofa, managed to get a hold of one of the blankets and wrap it around himself as he stared at his hands. And that, combined with the suddenly prominent bags under his red-rimmed eyes, allowed anyone within range to see just how tired the kid was. And not the kind of tired the erasure hero feels, which is usually the result of a non-existent sleep schedule, but the kind of deep-rooted weariness that came after such a mentally exhausting experience. Oh, now that's interesting. Shota didn't know how to deal with mentally fragile kids, but he did know how to deal with exhaustion. As if a light bulb had lit up over the underground hero's head, he walked over to the fridge and began rummaging through the top shelf, pulling out the item he was looking for and lightly tossing it into Midoriya's hands. The boy reared back slightly in surprise before examining the label on the juice pouch. Mango Tango, the bright side of the sweet sun? Midoriya quirked an eyebrow at him and he rolls his eyes. I didn't choose the names. Shota grumbled out before plopping down on the sofa across from the kid. Midoriya didn't look too convinced, but he screwed off the cap and began slurping anyway. The underground hero sighed and tried to organize his thoughts. Yes, he knew how to deal with exhaustion. First, the cold juice pouches contained just the slightest hint of caffeine in them, and that combined with the sharp fruity flavor would be more than enough to give Midoriya some of his energy back. It's what he used after a particularly draining patrol, except five in a row because they clearly didn't have as much caffeine as he would have preferred. Second, he focused on what he knew. The facts. He hated having to wait to do his job just because some hero kept beating around the bush using fancy words with dramatic pauses, and he assumed Midoriya may feel the same right about now. Just a tad bit more fragile. Not wasting another second, Shota began to speak. So, while you're eating, I'm going to state what I understand about the current situation. You can disagree on anything I say, but keep in mind that there will most likely be no valid reason for that. Wow, he really did sound like a robot. Still, the kid nodded, slurping away in sniffling silence. The speech you made on stage about 15 minutes ago was about you. Midoriya raised his hand, not even two sentences in. Well, uh, technically, the speech wasn't actually about me. Jesus Christ, and they made so much progress earlier. 
It was about kids who got bullied for villainous and mutant quirks, and I didn't have either of those. No, you didn't. In fact, you didn't have a quirk at all back then, however far back then is to you. You were a late bloomer. Midoriya twitched at the term, but Shota assumed it was because it was a difficult time in his life. And I assume you experienced the same things the kids in your speech did because of that, if not worse. How could it have been worse, though? Uh, yeah, some people were mean, and they might have gotten a little too rough with the teasing sometimes, but besides that, I was mostly ignored. Ignored by a lot of people. The kid's eyes flashed with something akin to melancholy for just a second before it disappeared again. Uh, and that's a good thing. If anything, it's just me being dramatic. Oh, hell no. Problem child, you are not being dramatic. What you went through wasn't okay, and you should know that your feelings about the matter are valid to have. Just because it wasn't everyone that harassed you doesn't make it any better. What counted as some, anyway? I still don't know the full length that this quote-unquote teasing went to, although I'm assuming it's much worse than you're making it out to be. But, whether you believe it or not, being ignored by the majority of people in your life is another form of bullying. There is no excuse for negligence. Shota chose to ignore how he was neglected for the most part, too. Shouldn't light teasing and isolation be considered a blessing on the bullying spectrum? What a painful mentality to have, and it's going to be even more painful to break. My life as a quirkless kid was probably easy when compared to Shinso or Shoji or anyone else with those kinds of quirks. I shouldn't complain about it. This quirk isn't considered villainous, and it isn't mutant either. I didn't suffer before I had a quirk, and I'm surely not suffering after. The heroics teacher opened his mouth to argue that any type of discrimination is still discrimination, but paused, fully processing everything the boy had said. Something about the wording of those sentences seemed off. Why do you keep referring to your quirk as this and the instead of my? Midoriya froze with wide eyes, which did absolutely nothing to tame Shota's suspicion. Uh, nothing. It's, I just didn't think it made a difference. Lie. I don't know what age you got your quirk at, but either way, you're going to have to accept that it is your quirk. The black-haired man found it a little weird to say, since it's the exact same phrase Todoroki mutters to himself during particularly difficult training sessions ever since the first year sports festival. Being a late bloomer doesn't make that any less true. But I'm, I'm not a late bloomer! It's not my quirk! The green-haired kid yelled in frustration before he realized what he had said. The scarred hands that were clutching his hair then dropped down to rest over his mouth in shock, as if he couldn't believe his own outburst. Shota sure as hell couldn't. Midoriya, what do you mean by that? The underground hero asked carefully, making sure he didn't accidentally scare the boy into silence with his urgent tone. Nothing. I, I didn't mean anything. I was just... Midoriya. He says again, a lot firmer, in the kid's size. Shota almost thinks he's going to fess up, but then he realizes nothing is ever that easy with a stubborn student that has enough determination to watch paint dry without complaints. I can't. It's not my secret to tell. Secret? Yeah, because that totally makes him feel better. Then whose is it? All Might's. Of course it would be All Might that drags his student into the most complicated of messes. Does the buffoon have anything else to do in his free time? He should pick up knitting. That way he can make himself some highly absorbent handkerchiefs the next time he decides to burst a lung and spew blood. Taming the endless sea of insults in his mind, the underground hero spoke. Kid, 
if this secret directly pertains to your quirk status and revolves around you, I'd say it's well within your rights to tell whoever you want. Plus, this is all might. I'm sure the guy would understand if the situation was urgent enough to call for it. Shota held a single hand to his heart. I promise not to tell anyone. Hesitantly, the green-eyed boy looked up. Is... does this count as urgent? You bet your mechanical pencils it does. He groaned, but in a way that made sure his student knew he wasn't angry. Because, really, he's not. All he cares about is his student's mental health right now. Nothing else. Midoriya seemed to consider it for a few seconds before hardening his resolve, and Shota couldn't help but feel relieved. So... His student began, and the Erasure Hero felt the faint urge to grab some popcorn. About ten years ago, Dr. Tsubasa did an x-ray on my foot. Aizawa Shota has never felt more dead inside until this very moment. He'd thought he'd heard the worst of it working as an underground hero, but clearly, he was wrong. So fucking wrong. The story, not a secret, story, a secret should have been a stupid rumor, not whatever the hell this was, lasted for about ten minutes. And, in those ten minutes, Shota has yelled things that should not be heard by a child. However, on the less explicit side of the yelling spectrum, he made several reaction responses, such as, Tell me the name of your fucking school. Bakugo said what? All Might said what? And on a roof of all places? The slime fight hero said what? So that's why the beach is clean now. You had to swallow it. You know what? No, that's disgusting. I knew the zero pointers were a stupid idea. All in all, it was horrible. His thoughts were all jumbled once the kid had stopped speaking, and now he couldn't decide which course of action he should take at the moment. He could either fight tooth and nail and shut down Aldera Jr. High, kick the shit out of Yagi, expel the shit out of Bakugo, or stop considering his options and just help the shaking student in front of him. Yeah, he'll go with the latter, and do everything else later tonight. Well, that was certainly... interesting. The kid flinched, and Shota mentally berated himself for starting with that. But I'm glad you told me. Midoriya's head whipped up. What? Why? When you first came to UA, your quirk did nothing but destroy everything in its path, including your bones. Of course, after two years, that no longer happens, but everyone assumed you had poor control over your quirk, and I agreed. But that's because we all thought you had it since you were four. When you said you were a late bloomer, I thought that some of your lack of control was justified, because maybe since you were past the age of a toddler, you didn't get the chance to see a quirk specialist. Now, however, I learned that not only did you get a quirk when you were 14, but the first time you even used it was the day of the entrance exam. If possible, the kid wilted even further. God damn it, Shota, just get to the point already. The point is, if you had simply told us in the very beginning that your quirk had just developed, we would have been able to get you the help you needed instead of watching you blow up your limbs. I wasn't allowed to reveal the secret back then, though. Curse you, All Might. You burdened a kid with a legendary secret and no one to help him with it. He told me that if it were to get out, a bunch of chaos would be caused by villains trying to steal the quirk. Not to mention everyone would lose faith in the symbol of peace. That's true, but there are other excuses you could have come up with. You started training for UA ten months in advance because your body needed to be able to at least partially handle the quirk, correct? Then say that. The quirk needed specific conditions to be met to come in. 
Or, if you didn't have any better ideas for an excuse, you could have told just some of the staff. If not me, then Nedzu. Lord knows I wouldn't question it if he told me you needed specialized quirk counseling. The underground hero doesn't question anything, the rat tells him, and he'd like to keep it that way. He's pretty sure that if he found out the motive behind all of his boss's actions, he'd have to be assassinated. Natsu does know, though. I'm sorry, what? And not just him, a lot of other people, too. Recovery Girl, Gran Torino, Detective Tsukauchi, Kachan. Shota's confusion got bigger and bigger with every name listed. All of those people knew, and not one of them bothered to tell him. The kid's homeroom teacher? And why does Bakugo know? The dark-haired man pinched the bridge of his nose and exhaled, trying to tame the anger. He wasn't mad at Midoriya. If anything, he's proud. For once the kid had done what he was supposed to do, tell an adult. But, of course, that's also the one time all the adults around him are psychopaths, idiots, or bullies. Fucking rat. He muttered, Arr... Midoriya furrowed his eyebrows. Are you going to expel me? Oh, for the love of- Why does everyone think I'm gonna- No, I'm not going to expel you. But, ignorant co-workers aside, I am going to give you the quirk counseling you should have gotten in the first place. His student looked relieved, but still a bit confused. Quirk counseling? Why would I need that, though? During internships last year, Gran Torino taught me how to not break any bones anymore, and I can handle anything under 40% of one for all. That's only 40% of his power? What kind of feral-ass quirk is this? Midoriya, you just told me your quirk was made by the most dangerous supervillain, passed down to his not-so-quirkless little brother, passed down through eight other corpses. All Might's not a corpse. No, but he's a walking one. And that ever since last year, you are somehow able to communicate with their spirits. Midoriya suddenly smiled with excitement, the kind of excitement one could see on him whenever he found a new quirk to analyze, and Shota knew that meant nothing good. Not just communicate, I'm getting the quirks too! He... what? What do you mean you're getting their quirks? You know how halfway through last year, during the joint training exercise, a bunch of black tendrils just shot out of my body? It's called Black Whip, and it's from the fifth user of One For All. Oh no. Oh god, please no. Please someone just jump out of a trash can and tell him that this is all just some elaborate prank. It's hard enough dealing with Midoriya's one, or he guesses two, quirks, but apparently he's going to have to develop five more... Lord, have mercy on their property damage, Bill. And this, this is what I mean by you needing quirk counseling. I'll be damned if halfway through your career as a pro hero, you suffer from brain damage because all of a sudden a dead person's quirk starts strangling you with their creepy tentacles. He groaned, but the bushy-haired kid just pumped his fist in the air and exclaimed, Right! Really? Just like that? No complaints about having to stay back extra time after school? Most teenagers would probably be attempting to sue him right about now. Quirk counseling is just analyzing your own quirk and applying your theories right away, right? That's basically what I do after school anyway, and Shinso only texts me after 12am. First of all, he's going to need to have another talk with a purple-haired kid about proper sleep schedules. And yes, he's aware of the irony. Second, you can only count on Midoriya to be excited about extra analysis. Shota gave a subtly amused huff. <laughs> sure, and... Suddenly, he paused as a random thought burst into his head, one he hadn't considered before. Wait a sec. You were registered as quirkless after your diagnosis, but you would need to register your new quirk to get into UA. And any changes made to the quirk registration are always logged down on personal files. So, technically, it could have been known from the very beginning. The kid stopped smiling as he put his fingers to his chin and thought. 
Yeah, you're right. You could have known from the first day, and all my excuses would have been useless. Why didn't you, by the way? The boy asked, and Shota cursed under his breath. I don't read my students' files at the beginning of the year. Helps prevent biases. He highly doubts he would ever have favorites in his class, but least favorites? That's way more reasonable for him. He's looking at you, Minata. But apparently, as always, this class is a different story. If I missed that big of a detail from one section, what else could I have missed? Personal files would include medical records, grades, personal notes from teachers, and even some family history. He didn't want biases, but knowing what he would be dealing with for the next three years wouldn't be a bad idea either. Behavioral issues, mental diagnoses, previous suspensions, all of them would have been useful to know, and the heroics teacher hates himself for not realizing until over a year had passed. In any case, he can deal with that later. Right now, he had Midoriya to deal with, and not just the enigma of his quirk. Right. Well, next week, me and Nedzu will come up with a plan for your quirk counseling sessions. And we're going to have to do some serious background checks. Background checks! That's it! Everyone in his goddamn school needs background checks! Wow. Dawning realizations feel great and suck at the same time. Into previous users of One For All just so we know what other powers might spring up in the coming years. But, quirks aside, we are still very off track about what happened today. Oh, right. And just like that, Midoriya retreated back into his shell with a look of deep dread on his face. Shota slid off the couch and into a kneeling position as he held his hands up in a mollifying gesture. That way, he was at eye level with his student. Hey, kid. There's nothing wrong with what you said today. If anything, you should be proud. The green-haired kid widened his eyes in surprise. It's not easy speaking about your personal experiences like that, but you managed to do it without cracking under pressure. And in the heat of the moment, you were still rational enough to look at your situation from an outside perspective and smart enough to admit that you needed help. You weren't being dramatic when you asked, either, and no matter the lengths your discrimination from the people around you went to, it shouldn't be compared to others in a way that makes you want to invalidate it. Getting help is one of the healthiest and hardest decisions a person can make. But you did it. And you should acknowledge that. Hesitantly, but surely, Midoriya slowly began to nod, the tears that were gradually building up in his eyes starting to dissipate and Shota waited for a few seconds before dropping the bomb. And to help you, we're going to need someone who has the qualifications to do that. He took a deep breath. So tomorrow, I'll be setting you up with an appointment for you and Hound Dog. His student shot up into a ramrod straight position, green eyes flashing with something akin to betrayal, and didn't that just twist the knife in his heart to see? Hound? What? No, I'm not. Therapy? His breathing started to speed up and Shota prepared for the slight chance that this may trigger something worse. Shinzo said all I needed to do was tell someone, but I, I, I don't want... Wasn't this supposed to be the end of it? I know you want it to be, and believe me, I do too. But these kinds of things are never easy. It'll take time, yes, but the end results will be worth it, kid. It won't! I've tried guidance counselors before, and they all just kicked me out. God damn you, Aldera. I'll tear you into the ground. They either blamed me or pitied me, and I don't want their pity. Does that mean he wants the blame? I want to be a hero so no one ever has to worry about me. He whispered the last part, but Shota heard him well enough. Well, whether you like it or not, they will. Shinso, Todoroki, me, your mother, All Might, and tons more. By completing this session with Hound Dog, it'll help ease that concern a bit, because they'll know you're in good hands. Midoriya seemed a tad bit more open, but still not fully convinced. Besides, it won't just be you. You're not alone when it comes to facing this kind of cruel treatment, as I'm sure Shinso told you before I walked in today. 
Doing this will help set an example for others who aren't too open about it yet. And she'll be the person that gives them that final push that they need to ask for help. Of course, all meetings with Hound Dog tomorrow are mandatory, but still. Way more open at the prospect of helping people, but once again, not quite there. With a resigned sigh, Shota gave in. And right after, you can get the hero merch. Midoriya accepted in the blink of an eye, and somehow faster than yesterday. He really has to keep his bribery tactic in mind for the future in case he ever needs to bypass public speaking again. Glad to hear it. Now- He wanted to speak more, most likely to tell him that just because he says he can buy merch, that does not mean Shota will ever be seen in the same area as a person wearing an All Might onesie. But a weird look in Midoriya's eyes stopped him. Oh jeez, he better not be trying to make it two pieces of merch. Yes? I was wondering, now that you know the whole story with Kachan and All Might- The kid fidgeted. You're not gonna do anything, uh, bad, right? Like, um, well- Break all the bones in All Might's body and blacklist Bakugo from every hero school in Japan. Midoriya, slightly disturbed at the specificity, but not at all surprised, rapidly nodded. <sighs> no, unfortunately even I don't have enough power to do that. His voice darkened into a whisper as his eyes gained a faraway look staring at the wall. I am going to do something much, much worse. Anyway, I have to make arrangements with Hound Dog, so off you go. I- wait, what? Shota's eyes glowed red as he activated his quirk, using his capture weapon to shoo Midoriya out the door, who was still frantically asking questions. What do you mean, much worse? Endless possibilities for what you could do in the span between now and tomorrow's counseling session. Read a book, paint a canvas, pet a cat. You only live once. The kid was still trying to push his way back into the office, but the door was already closing. Will you at least go easy on them? The kid asked desperately. The underground hero looked up from his recently grabbed phone to grin evilly into the distance. No. No. I don't think I will. The door shut with a slam. And that's what brings Shota to the present moment, straightening out a stack of personal files on his students on the desk as Midoriya scribbles in his notebook at the other end. It's Friday morning, and he still hadn't been able to come up with a proper revenge, a uh, teaching lesson plan for All Might and Bakugo. He wants something incredibly dreadful and dramatic, but not enough to get him arrested. And unfortunately, he hasn't got any ideas nor do his friends. In fact, they seem pretty disturbed when he called them at 10 p.m. for advice, but he guesses it was partially his fault for phrasing the question as, what's the most convenient way to torture a middle-aged skeleton and angsty teenage grenade at the same time with minimal casualties and lawsuits? He would have called Netsu for advice, but currently, he's a bit annoyed at the rat. Anyway, he can figure that out later. Back to the files. He's made a plan to read through each file, which is in the order that the students will be taken in for counseling, and suggest specific topics for Hound Dog to bring up when he speaks to them. And, along with that, he'll also be taking notes of any further details he should investigate. He originally planned to have Midoriya integrate back into his classes just for today, but immediately squashed that. The kid's life had changed enough yesterday, and he was probably going through enough stress no need to freak him out more by sending him off without an explanation. And besides, taking diligent notes does seem like a healthy method of relieving stress. That doesn't mean he's going to keep him here forever, though. He will need to go to Hound Dog eventually. But luckily, his secretary's appointment is at the very end. That way, he won't be here when Shota goes through his own file. That'd be just awkward. And while the underground hero doesn't know what's in the file yet, he has a sinking feeling it won't be anything good. Sighing, he opened the first file. Todoroki.
born January 11th, 20XX, is currently 16 years old, his quirk is half hot, half cold, which honestly sounds a little too convenient given his parents' quirks. Enchi Todoroki, Endeavor, is his father, Rei Todoroki is his mother, and locked into a mental institution? The hell? Already one pointer to suggest. His older sister is Fuyumi Todoroki, his older brother is Natsuo Todoroki, and his other older brother is... Ah, shit. Toya Todoroki? Deceased. Two pointers. Moving on, Shota went beyond the first page of basic information and struck the most disturbing gold he'd ever seen. Todoroki was homeschooled by a tutor. Meanwhile, the rest of his siblings were sent to some fancy academy through their whole lives. He's not surprised about the prestige of the older Todoroki school, their father is the number one hero now after all, but he is more than a little concerned about why his student was singled out and isolated after leaving preschool, after his quirk came in more specifically. Three pointers. After the age of four, his medical results took a drastic turn, but only the most basic information was recorded. Height, weight, vaccinations, etc. But nothing on injuries. With a quirk like that, it's bound to happen, but why isn't there anything written down on his file from the, uh, Shizuoka private treatment facility? Not the general one? Another pointer, but just for himself to investigate. With a sigh, Shota turned the page. Why did so much change after he gained his quirk? Or did the same thing happen to Toya before Endeavor quote-unquote moved on? Shoto Todoroki Session, administered by Ryo Inui, Hound Dog. So! Hound Dog began, gruff voice contrasting his current position of leaning back in an armchair and holding a pencil above the clipboard. To begin, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about some of your at-home hob. The hunting dog hero was cut off immediately. I don't know why I was brought in here, but I am not going to discuss my home life with a... Whatever your position is, I only came here because it was mandatory, but I refused to participate in anything else. A blanket of silence draped over the room after Todoroki's statement, but the guidance counselor didn't let it last for long. Okay. The red and white haired boy's eyebrows twitched. We won't discuss your home life. We... we won't? You're really not going to fight me on that? The hero shook his head. A funny action for a dog. I won't fight you on it, and either way, I'm legally not allowed to. You are forced to come here, but I can't force you to answer my questions. The heterochromatic-eyed boy seemed a tad bit suspicious, but ultimately untensed in relief. However, our session does last for another thirty minutes, and I doubt it'll be fun for either of us to sit in complete silence the whole time. I won't ask you to speak about your life unless you consent to it, but how about a different topic? Like what? Todoroki asked, and Hound Dog thought for a moment before answering. Well, for starters, you could tell me about your notebook of theories. The boy lit up in excitement, albeit barely noticeable. Sometimes I overhear young Midoriya and Uraraka speaking of it, and occasionally Eraserhead too. I must admit I'm a bit curious about the contents of it. So, mind listing a few? The hero student smiled, once again in a very subtle way, but certainly there. Todoroki listed everything he could remember from his notebook, which was quite a lot. Momo is Fat Gum's niece, Togoyami is Hawks' nephew, Tamaki Amajiki is Midnight's son, Toga Himiko is Vlad King's daughter, Midoriya is All Might's secret love child, Shinso is Aizawa's and Hizashi's secret love child, with Kayama acting as the surrogate, Dabi is his long-lost older brother, Shigaraki, knowingly, and Midoriya, unknowingly, both robbed the same clothing store, and the only reason that the former is a villain is that he's the one that got caught. Finally, after what seemed like centuries, the boy had finished, and the hunting dog hero spoke up. I see. That's quite a lot you got there. 
In fact, I noticed a common trend with all of your theories. In one way or another, two or more people are related. Any specific reason why, or was it just by chance? He asked, subtly clicking his pen as the student broke off into a tangent. I hadn't noticed it before, but I assume it's because it's the easiest to spot. Hmm, but why exactly? What makes it so simple? Usually, I can tell because of the multiple traits that they share. For example, Shinso's theory would work because he has the same eye bags and grin as Aizawa sensei, has a voice activated quirk like Hizashi sensei, and has purple hair and eyes just like Kayama sensei if mixed with a lighter blonde color. Todoroki explained easily. While that would make sense, there are some flaws in your deductions that have come to be apparent to me. While Yoyurosu and Fat Gum's quirks are similar, they both have very different purposes. One is used to create materials, and the other is meant to be used as a defense mechanism. And besides, there are many people in Japan whose quirks would also rely on their lipid cells. Houndog took a breath before continuing. As for Midoriya and All Might, they both have strength-enhancing quirks, but, as I'm sure you've seen... All Might doesn't have the same black liquid-type material that sprouts from his body like your classmate does, and plenty of other people in the world have strength enhancement quirks as well. And I'm sure those other people aren't all related, right? The hero student seemed to process all of his guidance counselor's critiques, deciding whether to listen or not. The obvious answer is no, and I'm 100% positive that you knew that too. So what makes these pairs of people so special? What is the missing variable you use to come to these conclusions? Hound Dog asked, preparing to write another sentence on his clipboard. In that case, I guess the missing variable would be how they act around each other. The fire and ice user stated quietly, as if trying to determine whether what he said was enough for the hero to understand or not. It wasn't. Care to elaborate? For this year's internships, Momo made the wise choice to intern for Fat Gum instead of Uwabami again. A wise choice indeed. And during the footage of one of their fights, I could see how well they worked together. It might have just been because their quirks required the same materials to function, but it seemed like they really understood each other. Like they knew what the other was going to say or do before they even did it. The same applies for Midoriya and All Might Sensei. Shinso and Aizawa-sensei, and Tokoyami and Hawks. Correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying that because a family goes beyond just physical appearances and traits and revolves around people's trust and love for one another? Hound Dog asked thoughtfully, already knowing the answer. Todoroki paused, but after a few seconds had passed, grew a small smile and nodded. And that's all Hound Dog needed to know that the student was ready for his second question. Good. And I'd like you to keep that in mind from now on, as well as for the next question. Feel free to shut it down and stay silent, but I am still a guidance counselor. Now, judging only by that new piece of information, would you say that you have a family? Forget about bloodlines and think of your mother and siblings when you ask yourself. Does your relationship with them revolve around love and trust? The red and white-haired boy seemed like he wanted to glare, to tell the hunting dog hero to go fetch a different bone and storm out, but in the end, all he could do was dig deep into the question and give an honest answer. Yes, I used to think my mother had hated me, but after a visit to her last year, I know now that that's not the truth, and it has never been. As for my siblings, it appears that I had underestimated them in the past, and that they understand my struggles much better than I thought they would. Although I guess it's my fault for assuming anyone would ever envy me for spending more time with their father. Neglected or not, they both know there were... less ideal alternatives. I see... And I'm glad to hear you feel that way, Todoroki. Houndog gave a smile, which suddenly morphed into something more somber. On the other hand, would you say the same for your father? He's... he's trying to be a better person, and I can tell that both my mother and Fuyumi are rather proud of it, encouraging it, even. They seem almost ready to forgive him. 
Hound Dog noticed Todoroki didn't even look the slightest bit happy about that, just conflicted. Is it just them? He asked, and the boy nodded. Yes. Natsuo doesn't seem like he'll side with them anytime soon. He's still glaring at my father whenever they're in the same room. Hmm, so your mother and sister are ready to move past whatever your father has done to your family in the past, and your brother is dead set on never letting it go. Hound Dog tapped the pen twice against his chin. But what about you? Are you ready to forgive him? To move on? I... The heterochromatic-haired boy clenched his fists. I know they all want me to, and I know it would be so much easier for everyone in hero society if I did, but I can't. Not yet, and maybe not ever. It just doesn't feel right, not making him pay for all the pain he's caused, and not just to us, but Toya too. He needs justice. We need justice. You need him to face the consequences of his actions, whatever they may be. And I agree. So, I'll ask again. Judging only by the last piece of information, do you consider Endeavor your family? Your father? There was silence between the two that could have lasted a millennia. Then, all of a sudden... No. The boy said softly, and then much louder and firmer, No. Hound Dog smiled as he wrote everything down not missing a single word and underlining specific details to elaborate on in the last 15 minutes in any future sessions. Once the scribbling had stopped, he lifted his head to face the hero student once again. Okay, now let's talk about why not. End of Shoto Todoroki Session Shota was halfway through reading Kirishima's file and halfway through subtly making remarks to Midoriya as to why he shouldn't use the merch negotiation to get anything related to All Might when a DING sound came from his phone, drawing both of their attention. The heroics teacher furrowed his eyebrows as he read the contact name, Hound Dog. He hopes the man remembered that the rule of doctor-patient confidentiality still applies even to a hero school. Quickly, he picked up his phone and read the text. Ryo Inui Yaoyurosu gave me the go-ahead to tell you this information. Thank God, or else they would be dealing with a lawsuit from one of the richest families in Japan. Mineta has been constantly sexually harassing the girls in Class 1A since their first year. Using his quirk to stick their clothes against the chairs, touching them inappropriately, clinging to them, and making sexual remarks all without their consent. I ask that proper actions be taken by Yue as a result of this. Hound dog. Shota inhaled, exhaled, used the rest of his willpower to force down his murderous intent, and maintained a stoic face. So... The gruff man began. We need evidence to expel Mineta, and hopefully send him to Juvie, preferably taking place within the next thirty minutes so we don't waste too much of our time on that brat. Take a pick. Witnesses or security footage? The boy grinned, and the underground hero wondered when his grins became less sunshine and rainbows, and more of showing off how sharp his teeth could be. The boy could still light up a room with it, but still, Shota never knew he had multiple variations to choose from. It was also pretty jarring how he hadn't even questioned why the great bitch was being kicked out in the first place. I've been practicing my hacking skills recently, and may said I'm a fast learner. By now it wouldn't take me longer than mm, five, ten minutes tops to get UA's video feed, so I'll take care of security footage. Okay, great. So Shota will handle the... Wait, he... Hacking skills? What? And Mei Hatsume isn't on this? The Erasure Hero gave the green-eyed boy a weird look. You practiced hacking into UA security footage with the support chorus girl? He asked slowly. Yes. Good. It's a useful skill. And it is. 
Shota remembers when he was back in high school, and Nezu interrupted his class just to give him a rundown computer so he could practice breaching the local police station's case files from any type of equipment. Although, now that he thinks about it, it was a weird thing to assign to a 17-year-old, but it did assist him in a couple of cases. Plus, more practice never hurt anybody. This could be a good learning experience. I'll take care of his testimonies then. Right! And if by the time 20 minutes had passed, six incredibly relieved eyewitness accounts, as well as a bucket load of video evidence, were sent to the Musatafu police station, and a purple-haired brat was dragged out kicking and screaming by a smug midnight with two pairs of eyes staring at him from the principal's office window and internally cackling, well then, they hope every damn girl in that school knows. Well, this is certainly a smaller file than Shota had expected. At first glance, and every single glance after, Bakugo was probably one of the most problematic children in his class, second only to Midoriya. The only difference between the two is that where Bakugo is loud, feral, sadistic, and powerful, Midoriya at least tries to hide it during class behind stuttering, bashful phrases, and extreme politeness. So really, can you blame him for expecting the explosive blonde's file to be at least five inches thick and filled to the brim with behavioral complaints and a long list of recorded detentions? Yeah, that's what he thought. Sighing, he flipped it open. Born April 20th, 20XX, is currently 16 years old. His quirk is explosion, fitting perfectly with his personality, by the way. Masaru Bakugo is his father, Mitsuki Bakugo is his mother, and oh boy do they make quite the couple. One visit was all Shota needed to see the dynamic of their relationships. Where Masaru was calm and meek, Mitsuki was temperamental and brash, and it's obvious to see who wears the pants in the family, although that in itself is slightly concerning. It's obvious that Masaru is the peacekeeper of the household, but when did it ever seem to work? At best, Mitsuki would only barely listen to her husband and lower her voice just a bit, but carry on with the exact same words that she was going to use in the first place. And if no one is there to hold her back when she goes too far, then how bad have Bakugo's and Mitsuki's fights gotten before? And Shota knows they must fight, because how could they not? Two deafening personalities in a single household are just bound to stir up chaos, and the underground hero isn't too happy about the effects that chaos might have had on his students. But even so, Shota read on, and promptly lost a little more of his will to live. The boy's grades were perfect, as expected, but that wasn't the weird part. No, the weird part was that his reviews were practically glowing. A pleasure to have in class. Absolutely not. Shota almost always wishes he was dead. A quiet and attentive boy. Sure, he's attentive, but who whacked a baseball bat against her head and gave her enough brain damage to think he was quiet? The term inside voice does not exist in Bakugo's vocabulary. But perhaps the most confusing review, and believe him, that's a high standard, was when his homeroom teacher in third year of junior high said that the boy was always sticking up for his classmates. Bakugo is a hero student, and while everyone knows that he'll never admit to friendship, they also know that he would protect his closest comrades if worse came to worse. However, that's Bakugo two years after joining Yue. Bakugo in junior high? It most likely wasn't a... No, scratch that. It definitely wasn't a pretty sight to see. Or, if you are Midoriya, to experience firsthand every single day. So seeing that the bully was painted as some sort of savior by his teachers made Shota more than just a little concerned and most of all, suspicious. So far, that's, what, three points to check up on? 
three to discuss, and one of them to personally investigate with Netsu. And that's just the surface level of information. There's still plenty of things he doesn't and might never know about. And really, that's fine with him. As long as Bakugo can work through these issues, he doesn't need anyone's validation other than his own. But still, may God have mercy on Hound Dog during this session. Katsuki Bakugo Session, administered by Ryo Inui, Hound Dog. Bakugo, a pleasure to meet with you today. Hound Dog said politely to the ash blonde boy. I know you're probably confused as to why. Ha! Huh? The boy exclaimed madly, kicking his legs up on the coffee table and submerging himself deeper into the soft cushions of the gray couch. His hands were stuffed into the pockets of his unbuttoned gray waistcoat, and only those who paid attention could see the way the fabric shifted in that area, signaling the flexing and unflexing of his hands. Interesting. The only thing I'm confused about is why you feel the need to be a sugar-coating mutt. Pleasure to meet you, my ass. Why do you think I was lying? Hound Dog inquired with a quirk of a lip, and the hero student huffed. <sighs> why wouldn't you be? You think I'm naive enough to think teachers enjoy my presence? This is obviously some poorly thought-out tactic of manipulation to get me to answer your creepy questions. Hound Dog lifted two placating hands, a calm expression on his face showing he was undeterred by the boy's attitude. Of course not, Bakugo. I can assure you that I am in no way trying to manipulate you into answering the questions, and if it'll make you feel any better for the remaining of this session, I promise to be straight and blunt with everything. The boy, still seething, managed to calm down a little bit at that statement spitting out a ch and begrudging acknowledgement. Now, with that in mind, may I ask why you think I wouldn't appreciate your presence? Why the fuck do you think that is? Is it not already obvious? That's still not an answer, Bakugo, and it's not as obvious to me as it may be to you. The hunting hero said. Bakugo's mouth morphed into a snarl as he leaned over the table. Hey, you looking down on me from under your wet-ass snout? Want me to compare the dog to human ratio brain size, huh? I would never look down on a student, let alone a patient. This office is meant to be a safe space where you can feel comfortable speaking what's on your mind. The blonde muttered a soft, safe space my ass. So, I'll ask again. Why do you think your teachers don't like being in your presence? You little... Ugh! Bakugo grunted, but answered nonetheless. I don't know. I'm loud. You think I don't realize my own volume? I ain't that naive, you wanna be air blood? Hound Dog clicked his pen for what must have been the 20th time that day. Never said you were. The hero scribbled something down on his clipboard, and Bakugo noted the action with narrowed eyes. But back to the original topic. You think teachers don't appreciate your presence because you're loud? I sincerely doubt that. Ashido and Kaminari are quite the loud duo, but all their classmates and teachers claim they're a pleasure to be around, to talk to, and share experiences with. So what is it really? No, pea brain! Stop misunderstanding my words! Sure, Pinky and Dunce face are loud as shit, but they're a bunch of excitable puppies. Gross, if you ask me. Something tells the guidance counselor that Bakugo didn't entirely believe his own words. And I'm not like them. I insult people, rude as shit, blunt as shit, and I wouldn't have it any other way. If they start sobbing because I hurt their feelings, then that's on them. I'm just telling them the truth their delusional brains refuse to see. Once again, nothing special. The ash-haired boy bristled at the phrasing. You're not the only one in your class, or even this school, to be overly blunt without caring about the consequences. Todoroki, for one, isn't afraid to speak of his theories to everyone who shows even a little bit of interest. It lets people know that he'll never talk behind their backs. 
Bakugo reluctantly respects the statement, and he says reluctantly because Hound Dog knows the boy is still annoyed from the time when the heterochromatic-eyed boy asked if Mirko was his babysitter or neighbor growing up. Hatsume from the support course is always upfront about her motivations and aspirations. Not once has she ever lied about her true intentions. And in those cases, all of their close friends appreciate it, as well as their teachers. That's not the same thing, idiot! They're still nice about everything they say, and everyone knows they're pure as freaking angels. Why won't you just accept that teachers don't like me and move the hell on? Don't you have a job to do, huh? The hero student yelled. I appreciate the consideration, Bakugo, but this is my job. I'm supposed to ask questions on anything I deem important to your mental growth, and right now this seems pretty damn important. So no, I'm not going to move on. I'm going to make sure you understand that your teachers, friends, and classmates appreciate your company and wouldn't mind having a little more of it. Besides, if the staff really didn't like you, then how would you have been accepted? Seriously? You think I got accepted because of my smelling the roses attitude and the beam of sunshine shining out of my asshole? Huh? Tough luck, you third-rate pound puppy! Did this kid ever run out of nicknames? I got into you, eh, because I'm strong! My quirk is strong, and I can use that strength to beat the living hell out of those slimy villains! Everyone here knows I'm going to be the number one hero, and that's why I got in! Bakugo smirked his signature smug smirk. Nothing more, nothing less. We done here? Far from it, actually. You didn't get accepted into UA because of your strength. Obviously, that was a big part of it, but you're ignoring another major detail. If a strong quirk and the number of pounds you could bench press were the deciding factor for becoming a hero, then this society would have been screwed over decades ago. I know that, you know that, Japan knows that, and most importantly, your teachers know that. Bakugo lifted an eyebrow, but... The disbelieving frown was still firmly planted on his face. Huh? Aizawa-sensei? Why the hell are you bringing hobo bastard into this? Because despite his questionable fashion sense, he's a hero and he's your teacher. Nedzu's favorite teacher, might I add. Do you know why? The student hated being asked a question that everyone knew he didn't have an answer for. So, the hunting hero continued without being prompted. Because Netsu trusts him to make the right decisions. Many people have criticized Aizawa's teaching methods in the past, saying his numerous expulsions were impulsive and unfair. But they're wrong. Aizawa knows exactly what he's doing at all times, knows who he's expelling and who he's allowing to stay at all times. If he kicked you out, that's because he knew you wouldn't make it as a hero in one way or another. But if he kept you, that's because he saw potential. And his idea of potential doesn't just rest in a person's quirk or muscle mass. It lies in their heart. If they have the heart of a hero and a true calling to help others, then you can bet your life he'll fight tooth and nail to keep you in his class. And, time after time, his teaching methods have always produced the best results. Bakugo isn't one for expressing emotions other than anger, annoyance, rare stoicism, and pride. But now, Hound Dog could say with 100% certainty that the explosive hero student was shaken to his very core, giving what he guessed counted as wide eyes to the esteemed guidance counselor after his small speech. It only lasts for a second, though, before the look is replaced with his perpetual frown, but with an unusual tinge of sadness radiating from it. You're wrong. He states simply, and Hound Dog huffs. I don't. You do, Bakugo. And I'm hardly ever wrong when it comes to matters concerning Aizawa. Bakugo gives him another confused glance at that, but moves on as if he had never spoken. Well, this time you aren't. I don't have this heart of a hero crap, okay? The red-eyed blonde flexed his hands again. What is that? An anger reflex? 
The hunting hero has seen the boy do it before, and it's usually followed by a small explosion. But by keeping his hands in his pocket, it effectively wipes off all of the sweat. If it's an attempt to control his emotions, that shows the potential for progress. I've done too much shit for that to be a possibility for me. Bakugo, if this is about the Camino and All Might's retirements- Ha! Huh? Yeah, right! That was last year! I know I'm not responsible for that whole stunt anymore. That's on Handjob, Staples, Blood Bitch, and Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The only thing that still pisses me off about that time was that some D-listers like them were able to get a leg up on me. Last time I was too weak to take them down, but this time... <laughs> the hero student started to cackle in sadism, hands shaking more noticeably as if he was physically repressing the instinct to blow something up. But personally, Hound Dog couldn't care less about that right now. Too weak? Whoever said you were too weak? Tch, my old hag! Bitch was cranky, but she wasn't wrong. Old hag? Does, does he mean his mother? His mother called her own son weak when he was kidnapped by the League of Villains? No extreme feelings of protectiveness or relief when Katsuki came home? Just... The need to victim blame her own son? That's not right. And he shouldn't have had to experience that. And that's exactly what he said to the boy. <laughs> victim blaming, huh? The explosive blonde laughed. A rough, harsh laugh that told everyone within range that he didn't actually find it amusing. He found it hard to hear because maybe, just maybe, it was the truth. I guess it runs in the family. The hero tilted his head at the phrase. You've targeted a victim before? A slow nod. And that's one of the things you're referring to when you say you've done too many things for you to have a heart of a hero. Another nod, faster and much harder. I see. Well, the only way to make up for those things is to talk about them. So, if you don't mind me asking, who was it? Hound Dog had never seen the boy so quiet before, so thoughtful and raging with inner turmoil. It seemed like he was deciding whether or not to respond, to give in, to spill his heart out during what might be the only time he can. Bakuga was flexing his hands even more, stretching them as wide as he could before clenching the fabric of his pockets again. It was clear he was trying to forget the counselor's question. To forget he ever came here and continue on with his life without any revelations or changes. But as he said, he wasn't naive. He was a hero student who after two years finally understood the best decision to make in this kind of situation. So, he took the olive branch. Deku. I knew him before you, eh? Since we were sticky-ass toddlers, BFFs, and before... Hound's dog motioned for him to continue. Before he got weak. Midoriya, weak? Are we speaking about the same boy here? The one who beat overall into submission? He saw some video footage taken from one of the officer's body cameras, and my god, it was a terrifying sight to see. It's not often the boy has that much hatred in his eyes. That's now! You didn't see him back in junior high, when he was a short little twig who shook like a leaf the moment a person even looked at him. You'd think that kind of person could be a hero? Nothing but a delusion. When we were younger, I tried to knock some sense into him, but that stupid little nerd just stood up again every single time. I'm telling you, I tried everything. Hound Dog didn't appreciate the implication of that, but he also didn't appreciate how in some disturbed, messed up way, Bakugo was trying to protect him. What a dumbass! Couldn't do anything! He was worthless, useless! No, I do want you to spill your thoughts, Bakugo. I really do. But it seems like this mindset may be the thing that's been holding you back. The ash blonde boy snarled at that, seemingly ready to leap forward and attack at any moment. But Hound Dog was a hero, and furthermore, he's a therapist. He knows how to deal with these kinds of patients the moment that he sees them. No human being is useless or worthless. Not a single one. 
I don't know who told you that somewhere, or that it was okay to verbally call someone that, but they were wrong. Frankly, I'm more than a little concerned about the influences that they had on you that still exist to this day. The hell you mean? You knockoff dog with a blog? The people who agreed with me on this, which by the way is everyone, my teachers, classmates, even some drunk bastard on the street agreed. That's how fucking right I am. We're telling the truth as it is. Didn't you say you appreciate the truth? Of course there are worthless people out there. Just look at all those villains. Those villains, at some point in their lives, felt like they had worth. Felt like others thought they had worth. And they did. Until, of course, someone came in and beat them down until they broke. And now they feel they don't, and their actions are the results of that. Actions that have caused quite a big ripple effect in society, by the way. So not useless for their own motivations, either. So no, you and your classmates were wrong. Weren't you there for Midoriya's villain psychology speech yesterday? And... He said quickly, speaking slow enough for Bakugo to coherently understand him, but fast enough as to not give him a chance to interrupt. Speaking of Midoriya, if you repeatedly beat down on him again and again just to force your own beliefs on him, it wasn't my beliefs! He couldn't be a hero when- The boy paused. Frustrated at something that apparently he was not allowed to tell Hound Dog. That's okay, he guesses, if it's personal information regarding someone else that can't be shared so lightly. He just couldn't! He had this major disadvantage, one that nobody can or has been able to make up for in this day and age. Yes, because that is totally not suspicious. You never know until you try, Bakugo. And it seems to me Midoriya wanted to be the first to try. You say you wanted to knock some sense into him, but did he really need that? You've seen Midoriya. He's always been one for analyzing situations to find numerous solutions, this week especially. He didn't know what side of the boy Aizawa was beginning to bring out of him, but he knew it was terrifying. I doubt he would claim to be a hero without a plan to back it up. And, even if the plan wasn't foolproof, can you really imagine Isuku, I smile at villains while I beat them to shreds, Midoriya being anything other than a hero? Bakugo opened his mouth, most likely to scream something like, Garbage man, deadbeat cop, McDonald's cashier, or maybe even dead, but no words came out, because deep down, he knew the answer was no no matter how much he hated it. Midoriya was born for this career. Hmm. Kid's too determined to settle for anything less. The hero said, and the red-eyed boy huffed. Guess that means the shitty nerd has the heart of a hero, huh? Well, yes, but what's with the spiteful scowl and tone? Yes. Hound Dog stated simply, scribbling down how the boy had squeezed his eyes shut for a millisecond. But you do too. I don't care how many times you deny it, Bakugo, but you do. I'm going forward with the assumption that when you were younger, you bullied Midoriya for trying to be a hero with whatever disadvantage he had that held him back then. And while that can never be excused, it can be understood. Not right in any way. But understood. It seems as if your teachers never told you that this kind of behavior was wrong, and that they turned a blind eye to it when you teased your classmate, and they turned a blind eye to a hell of a lot more than that! And, and I did a hell of a lot more than that! You think I just teased him? Seriously? I fucking tortured him! The boy's voice cracked at the end, and Hound Dog held out a hand to... I don't know, hand him a tissue? Comfort him? Can one really comfort Bakugo without getting their hand bitten clean off? But the boy kept speaking. You asked if I was there during Deku's villain psychology speech? I was. Right in the back with the best view and the speakers right behind me. I heard every word of it. I heard him describing what it was like for a kid with a villainous quirk to be at school as if the idiot wasn't drawing from his own experience as a... Shit, whatever. I can't tell you what he was, but you get the point. And 
You know that stupid thing people say about how looking at your experiences and actions from an outside perspective can give you a whole new understanding of it? It's true. So fucking true. Everything people did to him, I did to him, was listed out for everyone to see and it was disgusting. What I did was disgusting and he didn't deserve any of it. But the teachers praised me for it and they ended up labeling him as the troublemaking child. All because of me! The boy was shaking now, hands out of his pockets and gripping each other like a lifeline that turned his knuckles white as they were pressed against his down-tilted forehead. After a few deep breaths, he put his hands back in his pockets and looked up, red-rimmed eyes and all, and muttered, Still think I have the heart of a hero? Yes, I do. Right now, I'm just trying to show you why I'm right, and that there's an error in your judgment of yourself, but it's clear my tactic isn't working. So how about we start from the beginning, okay? You think Midoriya has the heart of a hero, but you don't. You think he has one thing you apparently never will. Am I right? One thing he has that I don't. What a load of bullshit. The hero course student leaned over the coffee table, desperately trying to quiet down his own small sniffling. He has everything I don't, and it pisses me off. He's determined, he's nice, he analyzes quirks and fighting styles like it's his second quirk, and he's All Might's golden boy. And guess what? He managed to do all of that with his major disadvantage. I had the one thing I knew, or I guess thought he never would, and yet he still was ahead of me. He leaned back into his chair again. The little bitch knew it, too. He pranced around like he was the shit with that dopey smile on his face, screaming, Hi, Kachan! With a squeaky-ass voice as if the constant reminder of my failures. He was looking down on me, and he did it for twelve years straight. <laughs> Maybe that's why I hated him so much. Not because he was weak and worthless, but because he had the nerve to be everything but... He didn't fit into the world you had created for yourself. He was the nail you tried to hammer down to hang up the masterpiece of your future as a hero, or just as a member of society at all, but couldn't manage to keep down. You couldn't control him, and you hated him for that. The boy nodded, resigned in his psychological breakdown, but not for long. Except you didn't hate him. Not really. Ha! Huh? You want crack or some shit, Scooey? I just said I hated him, and I do! I hate everything about that piece of shit, so don't you dare tell me that I don't! I'm sorry, but explaining people's feelings to them is sort of in the job description. Bakugo rolled his slightly watery eyes. You may think you hate Midoriya, but you don't. You just didn't understand him. And when I say that, I don't mean you misunderstood his feelings about you or his disad- Actually, you did. But that's not what I'm referring to. You just didn't understand how someone like him could exist. How someone who has so much less than you managed to have so much more, even with your constant berating, and managed to be the one outlier in life that you couldn't predict. This confused you, but she perceived that confusion as anger. So, instead of trying to sort things out with your classmate, you lashed out at him, bringing us to this very moment. It's... what? No, that's stupid! And furthermore, do you honestly think he was looking down on you? Because the Midoriya I know would die before he did something even remotely similar to that. He said hi to you in the hallways. He smiled in your direction, and he keeps calling you by what I assume was a childhood nickname that was a symbol of your friendship. No matter how many times you blew up his stuff, insulted him, and told him to take a swan dive off a roof, which, by the way, we will be talking about, suicide baiting is wrong, I don't care how angry you were at the time, it is messed up, he still came running back to you, and you know why? The boy shook his head, the slight tremors in his body and the wavering eyes giving away his fear and anticipation for the answer. Because despite all your flaws and shortcomings, he wanted to be your friend. That's how much you meant to him. 
and that's when the dam broke. But it didn't break in the way most people would have expected it to. For them, they'd most likely break down crying as years of denial finally caught up with them and they were forced to face the truth. Either that, or they'd start yelling until their vocal cords broke. And that's probably what Bakugo seemed like he'd do. Except he didn't. For once, he was quiet. Face carefully blank as he bit his bottom lip until it drew blood and clenched the fabric of his inner pockets. Somehow, that was even worse. Then suddenly, he spoke. Shit. Of course. Shit. Fuck fucking shit. Bloody fucking hell. The boy's hands finally left his pockets as they gripped his spiky blonde hair, his head facing the ground as his breathing got louder. You're lying, right? You're lying! I hate him! He hates me! That's it! End of story! This story is a lot more complex than a single sentence, Bakugo. And I can guarantee you it's not over yet. Well, why the hell not? If you're not lying, then that means Deku actually... What? That he liked me? That he honest to God wanted to be my friend? And, and that would just mean that this whole time, while I was kicking him in the gut and telling him to kill himself, that he just wanted to... to... Shit! He might have had... No, he, he would have been the only one to want that. Even after all the shit I pulled on him, he just... He can't just forget that! You are right about all of that. Through it all, he just wanted a fresh start. But that's not to say he will forget about everything you did to him. Because what you did, whether either of you would like to believe it or not, left lasting damage. And before the end of the day, I'm going to speak with him and try to work out that damage and hopefully lighten the load. The boy's red eyes widened at the statement about his next appointment. But still, Midoriya doesn't hate you. He never has, for reasons even I can't explain. But I assume it's because, through your entire lives, he saw something in you that others didn't. The real you. The part of you who is determined, kind, analytical, and an all might fanboy just like him. The part of you that has the heart of a hero. And he did all of that because he wanted to restore that part. So, there you have it. That's my answer. You've made mistakes, that much is clear, but... Just the fact that you're sitting here right now and trying to understand it shows that you feel regret. And that's all I need to know for me to call you a hero. The explosive blonde choked a hound dog's words. It was a sorrowful and raw sound. Heh, <laughs> what's regret gonna do? It's too fucking late now. He said that whole speech yesterday and probably realized it was stupid to keep his expectations set on me. Now it's just a lost cause to keep thinking about. So can we move on to whatever the fuck you were saying about teachers not completely hating my presence? Midoriya doesn't consider anything to be a lost cause. Those words simply don't exist in his vocabulary. And what have you ever known him to give up? I don't know exactly what his disadvantage was, but it seems to me like he had enough stored-up willpower to climb over the obstacle. If the result of that was becoming a hero, then I doubt he'll give up on something as simple as becoming friends again. Or, if that's too major of a step for you, then maybe you can just become... classmates. Start over. But what if he doesn't give up on it? The hero student pressed. Anxiety lacing his voice. Do you want to give up? Hound's dog asked in response. Are you deaf, you shitty dog-human hybrid? Good. Then show him that. If he sees even a little bit of reciprocated hopeful feelings from you, then your chances of having him continue his goal will raise. So work on doing that. But how? It's simple, really. Hound's dog clicked his pen once more and placed it above a new sheet of paper. We are going to list out everything you regret from yours and Midoriya's past. After all, seeing your actions written down allows you to confront it and work on how to make up for it in the only way you can. Saying you're sorry. 
End of Katsuki Bakugo Session. Time had passed by faster than Shota or his secretary realized, and before they knew it, it was thirty minutes until the end of school, just in time for Midoriya's session. Of course, as soon as his green-haired student had noticed the time, he immediately retreated into that familiar bush of anxiety, falling back into his old habits. Wringing his hands, shallow but rapid breathing, eyes darting towards every escape route he could find, which, by the way, included the window, and, for some reason, Shota wouldn't mind if the boy ended up throwing another chair because the expression on Vlad's face would be worth the property damage. Snapping out of his daydreaming, Shota closed the file he had just been reading, which belonged to the one and only Kaminari, who, according to Hound Dog, who had once again been given permission by the blonde-haired student to disclose this information to the underground hero, had ADHD, numerical dyslexia, and auditory processing disorder. Shota once again cursed himself for not realizing something was wrong when Kaminari struggled to understand topics from class or apply them during tests. But he's glad he knows this now. It'll allow him to make the necessary preparations to help his student and, hopefully, others will come forward so he can assist them too. Problem, child. The green-eyed boy's head snapped towards his teacher. You ready to go? Stupid question. He already knew the answer was no. Uh, well, yeah, totally ready. I just need to, um, check through all of my notebooks before I go because I think I left a 1,000 yen bill in the middle of a couple pages and that's like my only allowance, so I'm gonna take that as a no. Shota leaned back into his chair to give off what he hoped was a relaxed vibe deeply contrasting his inner panic. He was worried about the kid. Of course he was. He had a mental breakdown the other day after speaking of his quirkless experiences just once, so forgive him if he's more than a little concerned about how he's going to react being forced to speak to a professional that he's never held a real conversation with. In all honesty, you have nothing to worry about with Hound Dog. The guy is as trustworthy as they come. You could cuss him out for all he cares, and he wouldn't even bat an eye. Midoriya made a small, scandalized gasp at the prospect of cursing at a teacher, but in a few years, he bet the boy will just be dreaming of having a go at Vlad. It's what he does, anyway. Isn't Hound Dog known to be pretty hard on students, though? I think he growled at Kirishima once during lunch. Well, that's because Kirishima stole the last of the girl to meet while Hound Dog still hadn't had a chance to eat. But as long as you don't steal any of his lunch, you'll be fine. He thinks so, at least. What would happen if he stole the guy's favorite pen, though? Would he growl at him for that, too? Or... Ah, uh, 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 crap. He's starting to ramble almost as much as Midoriya. Do you speak from experience, or is this a theory you plan on using the scientific method for? Great. The kid got him in a box here while he was attempting to be even a little bit reassuring. He knew the whole smart-ass analytical genius thing would come back to bite Shota in the ass one day. He just never thought it'd be right before a therapy session. Both. I'm planning on nicking a couple of his office supplies and seeing his reaction after, but I was also forced to have a session with him during the second trimester of my second year. The green-haired boy's eyes widened tenfold. I told him to go choke on a chew toy before storming out, and he didn't rip my head off. So, I count that as a win. The point is, he's more understanding than you'd expect. He's not the kind of person to pressure someone into answering a question. If you say you can't answer, he'll back off. If you say it's uncomfortable, he'll never mention it again. If you repeatedly rant to him about why cats are superior, and that you'd be much more inclined to talk if you were being interviewed by one instead, he'll very kindly move you back to the original topic and do you a favor by never mentioning that again. Oh, well, that's good, I think. But if I'm hearing this right, does that mean you've never actually sat through a complete session with him? He lasted all of five minutes before his newly developed personality kicked in and forbade him from sharing any repressed feelings. Not that he had any, and that had to count for something. Do as I say, not as I do. A little too late for that, though, don't you think? 
A voice whispered in his head, and he quickly shut that down as quickly as he could. Sure, he was pretty damn happy that the legacy of his chair-slash-window damage lives on, but he'd rather die than see the day where Midoriya becomes the new him. He's got nothing against the kid, he just has everything against himself. No sleep schedule, an unhealthy addiction to caffeine, probably repressed emotions, and living under Netsu's watchful gaze 24-7. Sounds like a terrifying life to him, and he doesn't want to pass that down to anyone. Okay. The boy mutters, and God, if that doesn't just break his heart. Hardening his resolve, Shota speaks. And just remember... Hound Dog will never theoretically judge you more than I ever will if I'm forced to buy a piece of All Might merchandise with my own money. He got an ugly snort at that, and the Erasure Hero counted it as a win, no matter how much he hated giving in to Emmy's habits. The kid eventually stood up, albeit reluctantly and carrying his notebook like it was a lifeline and a comfort object, and left Netsu's office to go see Hound Dog. It was only when the disappearing footsteps had completely stopped did Shota open up Midoriya's file, and felt another urge to break something. Born July 15th, 20XX, is currently 16 years old. This quirk is registered as Superpower, but it shows the previous title of Quirkless right underneath, and wow, Shota starting to wonder how he didn't realize the secret of one for all sooner. Inko Midoriya is his mother, Hisashi Midoriya is his father, and the underground hero will be thinking about that man's name for the next two days like the paranoid hero that he is. Both numbers are written down, despite Inko being the only one present during hospital visits and parent-teacher meetings, so he's at least relieved to know that there are no underlying abandonment issues in there. But that's not the issue he was talking about. The section of the boys' grades is exactly how he expected it to be. Straight A's. But it's the teacher's personal notes on him that make him want to rip his hair out in confusion. Always picking fights. You mean getting physically harassed by other students? Disruptive and loud in the classroom. Is this the same kid who took a month before he could confidently answer a question or raise his hand without yanking it back down in anxiety? Doesn't take schoolwork or career counseling seriously. Once again, is this the same kid who wrote a five-page essay on what was supposed to be a two-page essay on the importance of having an aesthetic in public? And that last comment was probably referring to him wanting to be a hero, which Shota can safely assume he got a lot of crap for. God damn it, Aldera, he will burn you to ashes! All in all, he's mainly confused as to why this record is the complete opposite of the boy everyone else at UA knows. The blatant favoritism to Bakugo and unjustified hatred towards his green-haired student is frankly sickening. Getting victim-blamed for everything that happened to him couldn't have been good for Midoriya's mental health. He just hopes Hound Dog can show him that, and be there to pick him back up when he falls. Isuku Midoriya Session, administered by Hound Dog, Ryo Inui. Usually, I'd start these sessions by asking you some beginner, disarming questions and slowly easing you into the topic I want to discuss. But something tells me you already know what you're here for. Mind telling me? Hound Dog asked, a comforting smile on his face that Isuku didn't know whether to trust or not. He didn't even know whether he should answer or not. He knew exactly what he was here for, but no matter how trustworthy Aizawa-sensei said this guy was, he couldn't shake the feeling that it was just another scam. Another adult trying to tell him it's his fault when he tries spilling his problems. He already knows it is. He doesn't need the constant reminders. I'm here because Aizawa-sensei and Shinzo said I should be. He said carefully, not wanting to potentially anger the hunting hero. I was quirkless for 14 years of my life, and apparently that's important to them. They said I needed to talk about it. You keep saying them and they as if you don't agree with their judgment. Am I right? Well, I, I, I don't know. I know I probably do need help, as they said. 
I just don't understand why. It was a bad time, but it's not like it killed me or anything. Aizawa-sensei keeps insisting that I wasn't overreacting when I told him, or freaked out about it yesterday. Isuku admitted quietly. You freaked out yesterday? The hunting hero asked, and wow, congratulations Isuku because you just ruined the rest of the session. Yes. The green-haired boy gritted out. It was a slip-up. I was just overwhelmed after the speech, but that's it. I agree you might have been overwhelmed, but if anything, that's exactly what you needed. It brought you here, didn't it? Isuku nodded, unsure of where he was going with this. And here, I'm going to do my absolute best to help you understand everything you find confusing about your situation. So, to start off, let's start with the facts. You were quirkless until your first day of UA. Yes. How did the people around you react to your quirk status? Houndstock asked, clicking his pen and scribbling something down on his clipboard before underlining it. What had the guy already deemed important enough to make note about? But questions aside, the one-for-all user answered. There were mostly just two reactions. Either they pitied me and saw me as something fragile that needed to be protected and isolated to stay safe, or they just... hated me. Both sucked, if he's being honest, but somehow the first one hurt more. Most of the people who did the latter thought my quirklessness was some sort of ugly disease. They thought if I even breathed in their area, then they would contract it, but other people were a little more, um, harsh about it. Can you elaborate on that? Well, <laughs> damn. Others weren't afraid to get close to me, but not in a friendly sort of way. I think they found it amusing to mess with me and make my everyday life just overall... I don't, I don't know. Uh, inconvenient. They'd try and trip me in the halls, make me drop my stuff so I'd be late to class. They'd write some questionable things on my desk every day with a permanent marker, and since Makoto-sensei wouldn't let me leave without cleaning it off, I was always pretty late to get home, too. They'd put tacks in my shoes, slam me into lockers, rip up my notebooks. That wouldn't hurt, not gonna lie. All that jazz. Which people reacted in which way? Houndstock asked curiously. For the first way, it was mainly adults. The doctor told me he was sorry. My elementary teachers told me they were sorry. My mother told me she was sorry. He loved his mother. He really did, but those words wouldn't stop ringing in his head. Isuku noted how Hound Dog wrote something down. Even All Might told me he was sorry. For the other way, it was people of my own age. Tsubasa, Riki, Airu. They went from being my closest friends to the people who whispered behind my back. Kachan too, but he was less of a whisperer and more of a, uh... Well, he took a more physical approach. It wasn't always like that, though. When you say it wasn't always that way, do you mean they occasionally stopped whispering about you? There was judgment in Hound Dog's voice, but something told Isuku it wasn't aimed at him, and rather at his former classmates. And that was a new experience. Yeah, they'd eventually get tired of me ignoring them, so they'd just say it to my face. Isuku slightly regrets getting his guidance counselor's hopes up about his past. I see. And I hope you know it wasn't alright to do that. They should have been punished for their actions. And were they? Isuku shook his head, and the hunting hero furrowed his eyebrows. Did you ever report them? I would understand if you didn't, but I'd still like to know. When it first started happening, I tried to tell my teachers about it. I didn't want to be one of those snitches that got others in trouble, especially since I was their whole motive for doing what they did in the first place, but I guess I was really bothered that day. So I told my home teacher about everything that had been happening lately, and she said, Isuku's heart started to beat loud in his ears. She said I shouldn't have egged them on. And I... She might have been right. 
So after that, I just stopped asking altogether. You think you out them on? Hound Dog emphasized the think, and Isiga didn't know how to feel about that. I probably did. When you're quirkless, you have different rules you have to follow. The green-haired boy looks up, but the hunting hero still didn't seem to understand, so he continued. You can't speak too loud or make big actions because it's just drawing attention to yourself and that makes you seem like an attention seeker despite your low status. If you hunch in on yourself, it's obvious you don't want to be noticed and that just makes them want to pester you so you know you can't get away from them. You can't speak about your interests or hobbies. It gives them ideas about what to insult you about and they won't stop insulting you until you never bring it up. You don't complain about anything or else they'll show you how much worse it could be for someone like you and tell you to be grateful. And most importantly, you don't try to be anything else than what they think of you. If they call you stupid, don't get good grades. If they call you weak, don't walk faster than them. And if they call you a social pariah... Isuku took a deep breath, trying to calm the blood roaring in his ears. Why was it roaring in the first place? Don't try to be anything but alone. I'm guessing you didn't follow your own rules. The counselor asked solemnly, and the hero student shook his head. I muttered a lot. I hunched and stuttered. I never stopped bringing my hero analysis notebooks. I never became what they wanted me to be, and I never stopped trying to be their friends. Now that I think about it, it was a pretty stupid move, huh? Thinking any of them would ever like me back. Hound Dong's mouth twitched into a deep frown at those words, but it seemed like there were multiple reasons for his sadness, ones Isuku himself didn't even know about. So yeah, I egged them on. It's my own fault, really, and I can't blame them for reacting the way they did to my diagnosis. I'm going to say the same thing to you that I did to one of your classmates. I'm here to listen to you, and I'm glad we are already making a significant dive into your past, but I won't sit back as you continue to live with this self-deprecating view of yourself. What? Self-deprecating? It's just the truth, isn't it? By not following those rules, you weren't encouraging them. You were being a human being. In a way, you are standing up for yourself. You shouldn't have to turn off your personality, everything that makes you, you, around others just because some of them don't appreciate it. So no, it was not your fault. You don't understand! Isuku yelled, his voice cracking at the end from just how raw it sounded. His vision was getting blurry, but he would not cry. He won't let this stranger see that. It wasn't just some people. It was everyone. No one liked my personality. No one liked me. Not the teachers, not my classmates, not mom, not all my not God, Sean. I was alone and I was being stupid by standing up for myself. I should have just shut up. You shouldn't have, and I'm glad you didn't. If it weren't for that determination, you wouldn't be half the hero you are today. Trying to limit yourself is what's holding you back from growing. And clearly, you have people that like you at Yue. Do I? Isiku asked quietly, but repeated it much louder the second time. Do I? Ida yelled at me the first time we met. Uraraka always gets creeped out by my notebook. Todoroki hated me during the beginning of the school year. And with all the bones I used to break whenever I used my quirk, I'm sure recovery girl and Aizawa said they hated me too. I got a quirk. I made it into UA. I'm going to be a hero and I'm still alone. This personality of mine is what's holding me back and it's a burden to everyone around me. Midoriya, listen very closely. You are not a burden. You weren't back then, and you aren't one now, and you will never be one. Ido was only hard on you that first day because he's merciless when it comes to the rules. You inspire Uraraka to try her best in hero training. You helped Todoroki use his left side. Recovery Girl just cared about you, and she's obviously very proud that you don't injure yourself anymore. And Aizawa... Are you kidding me? He took you on as his secretary this week because he sees potential in you and your analysis skills and your personality. 
Isuku choked on a sob, but bit his lip before any more could come out. You have to start accepting that things are different now, that you aren't alone anymore, and that Yue isn't like your previous schools. You also have to stop blaming yourself for the actions of others. But it's my- It's not. Hound's dog said firmly, but no trace of malice in his voice. Your classmates were cruel to you out of their own volition. Your teachers turn a blind eye to that treatment, even though they should have done their jobs correctly as adults. And none of that is on you. After years of them telling you it was, I can see why you may think that. But it's not, and I know that deep down you agree. I also know that you hated the way things were back then, given how passionate your speech was yesterday. Isiga's eyes widened. He knew it was about me? But because everyone kept telling you it was your fault, you felt like you couldn't be angry. You thought you should feel the way they wanted you to feel. Defeated. And when you didn't, you felt ashamed and guilty. And now, I think I know why your teacher said you needed help. Why? After your speech and quote-unquote freak out, Aizawa must have realized that it was the only time you let your true feelings on the matter show. All those emotions you shoved under layers of enthusiasm and smiles were finally starting to seep out. But the very next day, it stopped. And that's not a good thing. Your teacher knew that the only way for you to make any true progress, not for hero work, but just for your personal life, was to let them out again. Because if you didn't do it now, then they're going to build up, and in a few years, the carefully crafted jar you made for yourself is going to crack in the most devastating way possible. None of us want that to happen, so he sent you to me. Sent you to get the help that you need and deserve. Deserve. That's a funny word. Isuka lived his whole life being told he deserved nothing except his corpse splattered on the concrete next to a high building. And now, after just a ten-minute session with Hound Dog, he's being told he deserves help. It really is strange how life works out sometimes. So, what... I'm just supposed to be angry and sad all the time? Should I scream at anyone who comes near me and start crying every five minutes? I might get fired for saying this, but yes. Hound Doc said honestly. Obviously, you shouldn't start lashing out at people for no reason, but you could try confronting your feelings about them and start being honest. And those emotions aren't just limited to anger and sadness, you know. Sometimes it's just confusion. But hey, screaming is a good tactic for some people. Helps their soul feel lighter. So, if that's what you want to do, go to a gym and bring your computer. Start playing the notebook and punch the hell out of UA's equipment, then scream and cry until you feel better. That sounded really nice, actually. Maybe he can get Mina's advice on other sad rom-coms to watch, too. <laughs> when I went to therapy, I expected some homework, but I didn't know it would be to immerse myself in pre-quirk pop culture and then. The forest-eyed boy chuckled. Well, I am a professional after all. Now, to make sure you understood everything I told you today, repeat after me. You are not alone. Oh god, this is embarrassing! Uh, um, I am not uh, uh, alone? Isiku stammered, focusing on the floor below him as his eyes got slightly dizzy. Good. You will no longer repress your emotions. I will no longer repress my emotions. The bushy-haired boy said a little firmer, opening his mouth to get more air when his nose began to clog up. Doing great. You did not deserve what happened to you. I did not deserve what happened to me. He felt wet, hot tears springing out of his eyes and rolling down his cheeks, and he blinked hard to let them splash against the carpet. And finally, it wasn't your fault. Isugu lurched forward, choking on his own sobs and trying to ignore the little hiccups that came with it. 
He considered bringing up a hand to cover his mouth, asking for a tissue to wipe his eyes, or making what was probably the smartest decision of running out before he could humiliate himself further, but he did none of it. Instead, he sat there on the plush, grey couch in front of Hound Dog and cried his eyes out without bothering to cover it up. You know why? Because he has the right to feel sad. He's sixteen. He's faced more things than he should have at this age, and no one is allowed to tell him what he can and can't feel. Finally, Isiku smiled, feeling lighter than he ever had, and spoke. It was not my fault. End of Isiku Midoriya Session Shota leaned against his car, trying and failing to get in the shade under the trees as he watched his students filter their way out of the front doors of Yue. Some of them were struggling just as much as him when it came to being under the sun. Some were stalling going home by huddling in their groups and idly chatting away. And the last three looked like they had won the lottery and had their entire family murdered in the same day and didn't know which facial expression to choose. The underground hero hoped it was an analogy other people would use, and not just something his demented mind came up with. But the disturbing train of thought aside, Shota felt oddly satisfied. Happy, even. And while that emotion was especially rare for someone like him, he didn't mind the warm presence it had in the pit of his stomach. He sure as hell had a reason for it today, too. Originally, he had been worried about these counseling sessions, worried that the students would start rioting about how it was absurd to force them to attend a session and speak about their feelings. Yes, he put quotation marks around that word because he knows for a fact that all of his students would say it in a whiny, sarcastic voice before proceeding to make random meme references at him. He knew it was necessary for students like them in the hero course, but still. And then... Like always, they had proved him wrong. His students took to it like champs for the whole day, and he knew that wasn't easy. Hizashi had told him that all of them had been escorted to Hound Dog's office with anxious expressions on their faces, wringing their hands, dragging their feet, attempting to negotiate with the blonde cockatoo into letting them skip, trying to take their clothes off in the middle of the hallway so they could completely go invisible and make an escape, etc., etc. But by the time their session was over and they got back to class, looked more content than they had in the past two years. With permission from all the students, Hound Dog had given him the information he needed for some of them. Asui would be attending sessions once a week from now on, as her experiences at the USJ last year still hadn't completely healed. He can't blame her. His didn't either. Uraraka was dealing with financial problems at home and occasionally couldn't afford to eat all three meals, and there was no way Shota was letting his students go hungry while they're training to be heroes. So, he made a couple calls to UI's financial department and managed to set up a fund for students who needed some money for school uniforms, lunch, and other basic necessities their parents' salaries couldn't manage on their own. Kaminari, as he said earlier, had ADHD, numerical dyslexia, and auditory processing disorder, so Shota decided to talk with the teachers sometime this weekend and organize additional tutoring or a specialized education program for him, as well as any other students that have similar issues. Koda is selectively mute, and Shota can't even say how grateful he is that the hero students were supposed to be learning JSL this semester anyways for when they have to work with deaf or mute civilians or co-workers, or else he'd be doing a lot more self-loathing tonight. Tokoyami needed a nightlight in his room, as well as bi-weekly sessions. Mineta was kicked out and... Shit, sorry. The Reishri hero just can't stop smiling at that today. And, judging from the other female students in the school, he wasn't alone in that. Grape Bitch was one of the only students who didn't come out looking happy from his class, and Shota wouldn't have had it any other way. There were, however three students that also didn't come out smiling, and they just happened to be the same three involved in his demented analogy from earlier. Toru, 
Aoki didn't exactly look happy when he came out, but he did seem less tense than usual. Hound Dog said that he'd be attending weekly sessions from now on, and although he wasn't 100% sure about a confidential theory that he had, Shota should look into Endeavor. And Jesus Christ, if that didn't make his heart fucking plummet! But Todoroki wasn't the only one who would be visiting Hound Dog that often. No, Bakugo Katsuki himself shared the honor with the weekly anger management sessions. The explosive blonde came back as he normally did, slouching with his hands in his pockets and a perpetual scowl etched across his features. He still yelled at people, he still made a small explosion in their faces when they pestered him, and he still called them by those ridiculous yet understandable nicknames. But something was different. He definitely wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, that much was true, but he did seem a bit more... how should he say this? Controlled? As the tired man said, he still yelled, cussed, and exploded at people, but he always spared a second of hesitation before doing so. He'd get this calm expression on his face, as if he was thinking over something, and not a bit to himself, and then proceed with the explosion. And if that wasn't a jarring enough sight to witness, the boy kept stealing glances at the problem child when he thought no one was looking. All in all, Shota thinks he should be terrified of what's to come, but he's also incredibly proud of whatever development the boy had made for himself. And last, but certainly not least, we have Isuku Midoriya with weekly sessions as well. The boy waltzed back into Netsu's office with a scowl that somehow seemed to perfectly fit his face and the trademark petrifying glare that sent Vlad sprinting in the other direction. At first, Shota had a small panic attack at the idea that his mandatory counseling sessions had actually made things so much worse for the boy and that he might have permanently ruined him. But upon closer inspection, he realized that he was wrong. His student, who had the rage of a thousand suns backing him up, was radiating pure joy. It was terrifying, but whatever Hound Dog said to him must have been pretty good to spark that kind of reaction. However, Shota doesn't have an explanation for the kid, no matter how goddamn proud he is of something he doesn't even know the full extent of. Because while he's good at making psychological breakdowns of almost everyone he has ever come across, he's not a fucking god at them like, I saw the sensei! Jesus Christ! The gruff man suppressed a flinch at the sudden noise and looked over to his right, seeing the bright-eyed boy himself, who temporarily shut off the scowl for this conversation. Problem, child. Hello. He said dully, but his kit student, his student didn't even bat an eye. How was Hound Dog? He was awesome! Oh, thank God. He didn't force me to answer questions. He wasn't mean or judgmental about anything. Yeah, he better not have been. Shota likes the guy, but he'd pummel him into the ground without hesitation if he wronged one of his students. And he gave me great advice. Oh yeah? Like what? The underground hero asked with a fond smirk, amused at the vibrating boy's antics. Not only was he genuinely curious to know, but the boy would have spontaneously combusted if he didn't get to share. He told me I should be angry! Wow, that's blunter than he had expected. Good job. And, well, actually, he said it in a better way than that, I think, but that's basically the gist of it. He said that the smartest thing I could do would be to stop repressing my emotions. He gave a couple of ways to do that, and most I could probably do at any time I wanted, but one required me to get specific items in a specific place. Shota listened as the boy talked on and on about his 30-minute session, relaying exactly what Hound Dog said to him, occasionally lowering his voice to mimic the tone that was scarily accurate, describing how anger and sadness weren't the only emotions he was told to experience more often, and asking him if he could get a five-hour gym pass next week as well as bring popcorn with him. He didn't exactly understand why he needed those last items, but he decided it would be a wise decision not to question it. Sure, just don't litter. 
and Shota received an enthusiastic nod in return. Finally, when the boy had come to the end of his speech and was about to run off to Shinso by the gates, he paused. Um, Aizawa-sensei? He asked quietly, shifting his feet and staring at his hands. I just wanted to say, um, thanks. I, I know it's technically your job to send students to the guidance counselor if they're shown to be needing it, but it's just that the teachers in my last school never did things like that, especially since I was quirkless. But you already knew about my quirklessness, and you still did it for the rest of the class, too. So that, that was, um, it, it was really... Shota patted the kid's head a couple times, effectively silencing him and getting a surprised look in the process. Yeah, kid, you're not the only one who's shocked. Since when did he start patting people's heads? But instead of saying that out loud, he decided to be a responsible adult for once. Anytime, problem child. The underground hero chose to ignore the way the kid's eyes became slightly watery at that. Now get going. I'm sure if you make him wait any longer, Shinso will abandon you for a cat. His kid, god, whatever, his kid gave a dramatic thumbs up and a megawatt smile in his direction before running off to the lavender-haired boy. Yeah, the kid may be trying to expand his horizons emotionally speaking, but he was still a happy-go-lucky onion at heart. A loud voice cut Shota out of his thoughts. Shota! Ah, there he is. Hizashi sprinted over to where he was standing before draping himself over the hood of the car. You had a car this whole time and you didn't tell me? Of course I have a car. Jumping over buildings every time I want to go somewhere gets tiring sometimes. Especially when he's running on 30 minutes of sleep. I just don't often use it because I hate the concept of parallel parking. And he does. So, why'd you bring it today? His friend asked curiously, eyebrows knitting together. The tired man gave him a look. You have to carpool with me at some time, right? A second passes, then two, then suddenly Shota is regretting all of his life's decisions as a dopey grin overtakes his blonde-headed friend's face. Stop. Stop it. Stop making that face, you knockoff banana. What face, show? The jerk was smiling even wider now, practically had stars in his eyes. The erasure hero wanted to be mad, he really did, but for some unknown reason, his glares weren't containing their usual spite with him today. Must be the goddamn sunlight draining his life force away. He sighed. <sighs> I, God, never mind. Just get in the car before I run you over. Hizashi cackled like a witch, but quickly rounded to the passenger seat because they both knew Shota was tired enough to commit manslaughter at any given moment. Still, though, he'd be lying if he said his friend's laughter wasn't contagious, and the underground hero eventually found himself suppressing a few snorts of his own. Yeah, being happy is an unfamiliar feeling to him, but maybe Midoriya was right about repressing emotions, and he'll be damned if he doesn't enjoy the warm, tingly feeling while it lasts. Oh, by the way, Hizashi said after buckling in his seatbelt. How do you feel about fostering a 16-year-old boy? Howdy, howdy, fellow rats. Long time no see, but I hope you enjoyed. Let it be known that I... Hate voicing Hound Dog and Baku Bitch. Like, genuinely the worst people to voice. Zero out of ten will never voice them again. I want to return that shit like Ikea. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But also, I do really hate their voices. Anywho, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, feel free to leave a like or comment down below, because I always love hearing from you guys, and make sure to subscribe so you can stay up to date with whenever I post. Oh, also... Holy hell, I reached a thousand subscribers! That's nutty. So thank you for all the support, y'all. Like, awesome. Anyways, 
As always, here's your little reminder to go guzzle down some of that sweet, sweet dihydrogen monoxide. And I have some bloopers. Enjoy. Uh, well, yeah, I'm totally ready. I just need to, um, check through all of my notebooks before I go because I think I left a 1,000 yen bill in the middle of a couple pages and that's like my only allowance, so I'm gonna take that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, really calling him out there. <laughs> <clears throat> bum ba bum Problem child. Bum. <laughs> oh no. The table. It's broken. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I think that's enough practice with Aizawa's voice. Time to start reading. Would he growl at him for that too, or ah uh, uh, crap? He's start. Oh, he he's starting to ramble. <laughs> I can't read. If you repeatedly rant to him about why cats are superior and that you'd be much more inclined to talk were you being interviewed by one instead, he'll very kindly move you back to the original topic and do you a favor by never mentioning that again. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Shit. <sighs> I'm sorry, that line is awesome. I, uh... <sighs> Ugh. Man, I almost did it too, and I, st I started giggling right at the end. Shaisa. <laughs> oh man, that's so funny to think about, honestly. No sleep schedule, an unhealthy addiction to caffeine, probably repressed emotions, and living under Netsu's wash bucket. <laughs> Why is he kind of relatable? <laughs> Honestly? <laughs> Mood. Shigaraki, knowingly, and Midoriya, unknowingly, both robbed the same clothing store, and the only reason the former is a villain is that he's the one that got caught. <laughs> Bro, the little, I just imagine the little green beans <laughs> robbing from a store. Oh man, that's... Oh. <laughs> Remember kids, anything's legal so long as there's no cops around. <laughs> the boy exclaimed madly, kicking his head... Uh, uh, oh, Jesus. Bloop, bloop, nope, can't read that. Stupid question. He already knew the answer would... Blah, 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 blah. Bloop, bloop, nope, can't read. Hound Dog said that he'd be attending weekly... <laughs> I can't read. The boy waltzed back into Netsu's office with a scowl. Oh my god, I'm good. am I gonna sneeze? Oh, come on. Fucking sneeze. Pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. Don't sneeze, come on. Leave a oh, pineapple. Okay, it's gone. That was unfortunate. His kid gave a dramatic thumbs up and a mega want smile in his direction before running off to the lavender haired boy. Oh, happy go lucky onion. That's so sweet. Oh, honestly, that's adorable. A happy go lucky onion. Aw, that's so cute. I like that. Oh, God. Never mind. Just get in the car before I run you over. <clears throat> Voice crack. How do you feel about fostering a 16-year-old boy? <laughs> Damn, really just comes out and says it. Honestly, Slay. We love that. 